Hi everyone, thank you again for joining us for our follow-up session today. Today, I want us to focus on how we pray through prophecies. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, teach us how to communicate with you, especially as we think through the prophecies you have given us. For we ask in your name. Amen. So yesterday, <clears throat> we left off where Jesus had just come down to earth. But you know, it might be helpful to understand just how specific the timing was for his arrival. You know, in one of the letters that God's messenger by the name of Paul was able to write to a church in a place called Galatia, he was able to say the following words. The name of the letter actually is the letter to the Galatians. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. The idea of fullness of time is telling you that God had given a prophecy in the time past and through a prophet by the name of Daniel about the time when Jesus was going to come, specifically how he was going to be baptized and even when he was going to be crucified. However, to understand this, it might be important to define at least three words for our study today. These words are as follows. The first word is prayer, the second word is dream, and the third word is vision. These are words that are key for us to fully appreciate what God is doing in the Bible. So prayer is simply this. It is simply defined as communicating with God as a friend. This communication does not have to be audible where people are listening, but it involves our minds to be engaged just the same way when we speak to a friend. That means we can pray silently or we can pray aloud. Now, it's important to know that the purpose of prayer is not always to change circumstances around us. As a matter of fact, one of the greatest value of prayer is that it actually changes us. When we talk to God, we are the ones who get changed. Through prayer, we actually gain the strength to face the things that are coming ahead of us. Now, through prayer uh, to God, God does something for us. He helps us with um, situations, especially the stressful moments, how to manage them. Dreams, on the other hand, are usually what we experience when we sleep. Maybe you have dreamt too. But in our context, it is a message that God communicates to his servants when they are asleep. Now, we saw in the very first session that there was a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar who actually got a message from God when he was asleep. The only problem, he went to the wrong people to try to find out the meaning. Now, the man uh, by the name of Daniel, who was a prophet, also got messages from God when he was asleep. The Bible tells us in the book of Job that this is uh, one of the ways that God actually communicated with people. So, for instance, it says this in the book of Job chapter 33, that for God may speak in one way or in another, yet man does not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering in their beds. Then he opens the ears of man and seals their instruction. Now, I want to be clear here. Not every dream that you dream about is coming from God. Sometimes it's just a function of our brain, you know, when we are asleep and we are trying to get some rest. So don't go there claiming every dream you have is really God giving you a vision about the future. Let's talk now about the word vision. Visions, as you saw in the reference in the book of Job, is also another way that God communicates to prophets. The difference between dreams and visions is this. In our context, visions are messages that God conveys to his servants while they are awake. Their mind and their thoughts, they are normally carried beyond the things that we can visibly see. And God shows them the things that are beyond what we see with our naked eye. It is no wonder at times in the Bible that prophets are actually referred to as seers. Does that make sense? Because they see. God uses them to see things. The Bible describes this experience as a time when a prophet may have their eyes wide open uh, through a vision. And many of them, by the way, when you read the Bible, they fall sick afterwards. They fall down afterwards. 
So the Bible tells, says this in the book of Numbers about a prophet who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with their eyes wide open, describing that experience. Now, I would like also to give you a caution right here. Not everyone who sees things during the day means they are seeing things from God. Uh, some may be due to an unfortunate illness and some may be under uh, some influence of some substances which actually may hinder communication with God. So don't just follow someone because they are seeing things during the day and say, oh, their eyes are wide open, you know, and they were falling down. That must mean they saw a vision. No, it's not the same with every single situation. So, and by the way, that's how you end up in a ditch when you try to just say, I'm seeing a vision from God and it's not from God. So I'd like you to remember a man by the name of Daniel who we encountered in our very first session. He was a man who helped King Nebuchadnezzar to get a better understanding of his dream when God actually gave him the dream as well. If you recall, Daniel and his friends had been taken as slaves to a land of Babylon. At this point, I would like to add that Another way that God communicates, as we have said before in session one, is through the Bible. We saw this specifically in session one. God is not silent. He is communicating to us. Now, that is, the Bible is a word that God has already given through other prophets or his messengers in the past. That means that Daniel spent time reading the words of other prophets, especially the prophet Jeremiah, which gave him hope on how to face life in Babylon. So here's the first lesson I want us to grasp, that reading God's Word, the Bible, helps us to cope with our situations. Because Daniel was doing this to understand what was going on. So Daniel records about a time when he was reading the words of God that God gave through the prophet Jeremiah in the book of Daniel chapter 9. This is what uh, the Bible records. Daniel talks about his experience. He says, I, Daniel, understood by the books of the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he will accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So you can see that this man, who is a prophet, also spent time reading what the other prophets had written. So let me give you a simple background. Daniel had been in communication with God during this time in Babylon. Every so often, he received a vision from God conveying an important messages of things that were going to come to them in the future. Now, the messages are what we call prophecies. Prophecy is a message from God that he gives to a prophet. However, one day he overheard some angels talking during a vision. It is a vision about the temple being restored with its regular services. Remember, the temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed when King Nebuchadnezzar had attacked Jerusalem. So he was worried in this vision that he had that the time they were going to take for services to be restored was actually going to be about 2,300 years. Now, I want to make a clarification here. Daniel knew two Bible principles that we all need to pay attention to, which is this. The first is that in Bible prophecy, one day is equivalent to one year. And we can see that in the book of Ezekiel 4, 6 and Numbers 13. But so anytime you're reading the book of Daniel or the book of Revelation, which are two key prophetic books, when you see days, it is usually a reference to prophetic years. So it also depends on the context, and we can be able to explain that depending on the context. But we shall all explore this, as I say, in a future uh, time. The second principle that Daniel knew is that God does not contradict himself. Listen to that. You see, when you see a Bible message that seems to contradict another Bible message, take a moment to seek better understanding of it. Or let's say what is more prevalent is someone comes to you today and tells you that God has told me this or that. And that message contradicts what God has already said in the Bible. Listen, dear friend, brother and sister, do not follow. Even, even if they tell you that the message is from God or they claim that they had a dream or a vision. Actually, God himself has already warned us about this. He says this when he was giving guidance through the prophet Moses to the children of Israel in the book of Deuteronomy. He says, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a, 
a sign or a wonder. And the sign of the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or the dream of dreams. For the Lord your God is actually testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God or with all your heart and with all your soul. This is key, friends, because today we have been cautioned about this. People will come up. People will try to tell you, hey, God told me this. God told me that. Remember that one of the lessons we talked about in session two was that there are going to be false prophets. We had to be very careful not to be deceived because we live in a time when many people claim the title of a prophet and they will claim to have received messages from God. Our best way to serve God against being deceived is to check with the Word of God, the Bible. But many times they these prophets may come up with a message that contradicts God's word. And when they say something, and this thing that they say comes to pass, they are likely to gain a major following just because, you know, hey, they said something, it became true. Be very careful. If what they said contradicts the Bible, you should not follow them. Are we together? Hopefully that makes sense. So let's go back to the prophet Daniel. When Daniel overheard the conversation with the angels about the 2,300 years, he was actually disturbed because he remembers something that was written in the prophecy that Jeremiah gave. Because the prophecy from Jeremiah said they were going to be in Babylon for 70 years. So he figured after 70 years, they'll go back and continue services in the temple. So when he was disturbed in this way, he decided to deal with this problem in a way that all of us need to do. This is how he dealt with it. It's recorded again in that same book, Daniel chapter 9. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request cloth and ashes. Here is a lesson for you and me. Always turn to God in prayer when you're disturbed by prophecies. In a simple way, talk to God as a friend about what is disturbing you. See, some of us today are troubled because of the state of the world. Many of us are troubled because of the things we have heard about how the world is going to end. You hear news and it concerns you. Prayer is not just about changing circumstances. At times, through prayer, we gain understanding. God makes some things clear to us. At times, it is about God giving us the strength to face whatever comes ahead of us. So God sent a messenger from heaven to Daniel, an angel who the Bible names as Gabriel, who came to explain to Daniel the words of the angels that he had overheard in a vision. And at this point, I would like to point out that the first dream that Daniel experienced about the angels communicating was actually recorded in the book of Daniel chapter 8. But the explanation is recorded in Daniel chapter 9 where Daniel begins to pray. It has actually been observed that the time between Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9 is a period of 13 years. This is an important lesson for us to consider as well. Why? Because we need to be patient if God does not give us understanding right away. You know, we live in a truly what we call an instant gratification society where if something is not delivered right away we give up on it but with God we have to learn to be patient and one of the things about prayer is God can give us endurance as we wait patiently for answers so when we are impatient with God's timing to understand what God is trying to say to us especially in prophecy you know what happens we begin to fall or to or begin even to feed into conspiracy theories. When we cannot wait for God to reveal, we begin to fill the gaps with our own conclusions and sometimes we expect God to follow our conclusions. This is a recipe for spiritual failure. Be patient with God. We also need to remember that God's time does not always match our clocks. Listen, because I say it's time to do this, it's not the same with God. At times we are frustrated because we say to ourselves, you know, I should have graduated by now. Or I should have been married by now. 
or I should have had children by now or I should have had grandchildren by now or maybe I should have retired by now or I should have had a job by now or maybe I should have had a boyfriend or a girlfriend by now and the clock is ticking and then the hope begins to fade. No. Prayer helps us to be patient with God's timing for understanding and also for fulfillment for the promises that he gives. Engage in communicating to God as your friend. Now, for the sake of our presentation and time today, I will not explain the entire 2,300 years as the angel Gabriel explained. I will just explain the first portion which regards the prophecy concerning Daniel's people, that is the people of Judah. Now, one thing that I would like you to be very confident in is this. And that is, God was not changing the plan with the prophecy he gave. As a matter of fact, what God was doing, he was revealing more detail to Daniel about what was going to happen in the future. God goes in these stages. He gives cycle of more revelation. Now, the approach that I will take, however, is that I will simply give you key aspects of the story. And at a future presentation, I will take out the calculator for you. And we're going to do a math lesson together. How's that? So for today, I'm just going to give you the simple summary. So Jerusalem, the city that the, uh, Daniel and his friends had been taken away from, was attacked three times. The very first time when we saw this, it began in the year uh, 605 BC. Now, just for your information, in case this is something you have not experienced before, during the BC years or before Christ or BCE, before Common Era, depending on your school of thought, the years were coming down. And so when you begin in 605 BC, we're not going forward to 606, we're going backward to 604 and the numbers goes down. So in 605, Jerusalem was attacked for the very first time. And then in 594 BC, it was attacked for the second time. And then the third time in 586 BC. Now, the 70-year prophecy period that was prophesied by Jeremiah is supposed to begin in the year 605 BC. So Daniel was worried that a 70-year period was coming to an end, and when he overheard a prophecy with the angels talking, it was about 2,300 years. And this is what he wondered if it meant they were going to stay in Babylon longer than the prophecy had originally said. But God began to reveal to him how things were going to play out. He said the angel revealed to him that there was going to be a command that was going to be very specific. It was going to be about rebuilding and restoring those two aspects, rebuilding and restoring Jerusalem. Very key in the book of Daniel 9.25. This is important because there were various commands that were given about rebuilding. And that was, this was after their captivity, but they were not as effective as the prophecy that had been given. So in the year 538 BC, there was a king who came in, a king of the Medes and the Persians. Remember session one, the following kingdom? It was a decree by a king called Cyrus to be able to rebuild the temple. Now, this decree was stopped by the Samaritans who actually opposed this. And this was about politics of the day. You see, the power plays in the halls of power today are not new. They've been there before. It took uh, about 18 more years until 520 BC when a second decree was given by Darius. And this decree, this time the temple was completed and dedicated. But Jerusalem was not yet rebuilt. It took another over a, hundred, oh, oh, a longer period of time, not really 100 years. In 457 BC was a third decree given by a king called Ataxaxis to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Now, this story is given to us by another prophet of God by the name of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was actually serving a king as a cupbearer. Now, one day the king saw that his face did not look very happy. Here's the thing, if the guy who is serving you a beverage at home or at the hotel or the restaurant does not look very happy, you need to be extra careful because either something is terribly wrong with the drink or something is going on in the mind of the guy. So the king asked Nehemiah, what is wrong? Nehemiah's mind was troubled because the city of Jerusalem was lying in ruins and his people were constantly being attacked. So instead of just blatting out an answer, the very first thing that he did, he prayed to God in a moment to give wisdom of what to say. This thing has been going on for like about 60, 60 uh, three years. God gave him the words. 
and the courage to tell the king what he was concerned about, that he was concerned about his home country and that it wasn't safe for the people over there. God impressed the king to give Nehemiah time off, listen, and then give him resources that he needed to go and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. You see, the Bible says to us that we have not because we ask not. Here is another important lesson about prayer. That through prayer, God can give us the boldness to ask for great things. What is it that you need to ask today that you have just not have the boldness or the words to be able to ask? Talk to God as a friend that he will give you the words and the courage to present the request you need to make. Now, by 408 BC, Jerusalem was rebuilt, and although it was in troublous times, we're going to see that when you read the book of Ezra, you discover that the Western governors really opposed the building of the wall uh, that was there because they were saying that Jerusalem had been rebellious in the past. Now, but here are some other important dates that we were included in this prophecy that we need to pay attention to because this is about the Messiah, the time that the Messiah was going to come. The prophecy did not talk about the time that the Messiah was going to be born, but what it did, it clearly marked the time that the Messiah was going to be baptized, which was going to mark the beginning of his public ministry. And so it was in the year 27 AD, the anointed one, the Messiah, was going to come. When the Messiah was going to come, he was going to be baptized. And sure enough, according to the Bible record and even historical records, the book of Luke, written by another follower of Jesus, tells that in the 15th year, when Tiberius Caesar was ruler, Jesus went to the river Jordan to be baptized and he began his public ministry. The prophecy of the coming of Jesus, the Savior of the world, was a prophecy that was fulfilled with very accurate precision. Because Jesus was baptized, not because he was a sinner, but because he was modeling for us about our faith journey. Now, you may be watching today and you would like to actually consider following Jesus in his footsteps and you would like to be a part of his covenant as we spoke about it yesterday by being baptized the way Jesus was baptized I invite you to just write to us in our email address and tell us that you would like to follow the footsteps of Jesus by way of baptism but the prophecy also points out that there are going to be three and a half years which are going to follow, and three and a half years later, there was going to be a very significant event in history. The promise of God to pay for the penalty of the sin of man was going to be fulfilled. It was going to be in the year 31 AD. You see, many sacrifices had been made, many lambs had been slaughtered each day, and each was pointing to the fact that one day the promised Messiah will come. And before going to the cross, Jesus did something. He gathered his disciples together to eat a meal that we call the Last Supper. During the meal, he took uh, them through a lesson, a lesson that he gave them through symbols. So he took bread and he took a cup of the fruit of the vine. And he used these symbols to convey to them that what uh, was a major significant event that was just about to happen. He was going to die at the cross, a covenant for many. And this body that was his, represented by the bread, was going to be broken on the cross. And this cup of the fruit of the vine was representing the blood of him that was going to be shed for the forgiveness of sins. And so, here's the point. Jesus Christ was telling his disciples about this and the first thing he did he actually went to the garden a garden ceremony where he prayed he prayed because he had taken on human nature and he struggled in fear about the prophecy of his death and i want to say this that this whole journey about him being separated by God, his father, about what it meant for him to give up his life and about how he was going to be rejected by the people that he had come to die for. He struggled with this, but he decided, friends, he decided he was going to die for us anyway. 
and so at the garden he prayed and said to the father even if i'm going to die and be rejected separated from you let it not be my will but let it be your will an important lesson for us that when we pray we need to sincerely present to god our request be honest but also trust god for his wisdom god sent an angel from heaven to come and strengthen jesus Shortly after, the soldiers came in a short while and they took him. They took him to the courts of judgment where he went through a mockery of a trial with many lies hipped at him. They flogged him with a Roman whip on the back twice, not once but twice. They made him carry a heavy cross all the way to a place of skull called Calvary. They stripped him naked on the on that uh, hill and they took the nails and they drove them through his hands and through his feet. They nailed him to a tree and all the while Jesus Jesus, who had prayed for himself, now was praying for us that we may be forgiven our sins. Prayer helps us to go through tough times. For about six hours, Jesus hung between heaven and earth. He was naked for three hours during the light and three hours of darkness. And when the time had come, Jesus had endured all that he was supposed to endure. He let out a big shout, declaring, It is finished and then he bowed his head and he died jesus gave his life for you he died so that you and i can live he loved you even before you knew him and here's a thing that jesus no matter how much suffering we go through is not because god does not love us he proved it on the cross he came to give his life that we may have life more abundantly so no matter what we are going through in suffering jesus gave his life so that we can have his life i'm asking you because jesus gave his life for you are you willing to give your life to him because you live because he made it possible I want to ask you today brother and sister just to give him your life it means to have him as a forever friend it means to enter into a covenant with him where he commits to save you and you will be willingly giving your loyalty to him will you be willing to take that step with me today just to allow Jesus to guide you in this step let us pray Father, I'm praying now for my friend who is listening to this message that, Lord, you may give us the chance to give our lives to you. I pray for those who have given their lives to you before the Lord, we may rededicate our lives again to you. But, Lord, for those who are thinking about this for the first time or who in a long time think they are too sinful for you to accept, please let them this day give over them their control of their lives to you that to be in a covenant with you, you will take care of them as we become loyal to you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, let's connect tomorrow. Jesus is not in the grave. Jesus is alive. We're going to talk about it. Don't miss. God bless you.
would be.